So let's start with uh, real symmetric matrices because those are very good matrices. Real means all the elements of the matrix are real. So we write A is a member of R n by n and symmetric means its transpose is the same as itself. So A transpose is equal to A. So the moment you have such matrices, the eigenvalues are real and it can be proven fairly easily and it's there in the textbook. Of course, when you're trying to prove that something is real, then you have to prove that it's not complex. So you have to step into the territory of complex numbers a little bit and you have to deal with complex conjugates. Now eigenvectors for such matrices are complete meaning they are full set and they are orthogonal too. So that is important. So when I say orthogonal once again what I mean is if you have an eigenspace instead of eigenvectors then you have the freedom of choosing an orthonormal basis in the eigenspace and that way the eigenvectors will turn out to be orthogonal. Remember eigenvectors specify only directions in the space. So for that reason any vector that is along the direction of the eigenvector is an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue. What that means is that we are free to normalize eigenvectors. So when you have orthogonal eigenvectors, we can always have orthonormal eigenvectors. So the matrix where we have placed eigenvectors as columns, which we call S, will become an orthonormal matrix. The signs of the pivots and the signs of eigenvalues are connected. The number of uh, positive pivots is the same as the number of positive eigenvalues. The number of negative pivots the same as the number of uh, negative eigenvalues. So this is Silverstein's law of inertia. So if you take a general square matrix, the elements are real. Eigenvalues for such matrices can be complex numbers. We saw one example, the rotation matrix in uh, R2. The eigenvalues turned out to be imaginary, purely imaginary in that case. And the eigenvectors also, they were vectors over the field of complex numbers. Now if you place the eigenvalues, regardless of the fact that they are actually complex, in a matrix, you have the lambda matrix, which is a diagonal matrix, and eigenvectors can be placed in a matrix also, a complex matrix this time. So this statement still is always true. A is equal to S lambda. This is always true because what I'm saying here is just the matrix version of what I said here by definition. It comes from the definition. But on top of that, if I know that S is invertible, then I can say that A is equal to S lambda S inverse because I'm just multiplying by S inverse on the right of the left hand side and the right hand side. And then I get that. And that is eigenvalue decomposition or diagonalization. Now, that is for a general real matrix, but if I know that the matrix is a real and symmetric, then I have a real eigenvalue eigenvalues and uh, orthogonal eigenvectors. Eigenvectors corresponding to two eigenvalues that are not the same, meaning distinct eigenvectors, they are all orthogonal to each other, which means you can choose the eigenvectors to be orthonormal really. So the S matrix can be written as an orthonormal matrix and our symbol for orthonormal matrices is actually Q. We know that an orthonormal matrix is always invertible because the inverse is just a transpose. What, what that means is that we can write A as S lambda S inverse, which is the same as Q lambda Q inverse and now Q inverse is Q transpose so we can write this as A is equal to Q lambda Q transpose and that is called the spectral theorem. First let's see what this guy is actually saying. The statement is saying A is equal to Q lambda Q transpose. Are the eigenvalues for a real symmetric matrix positive? No, it's not guaranteed to be positive. No, not at all. It can be anything. In fact, let me say this at this point. A real symmetric matrix, let's say 5, 3, minus 1, 0, 0, zero what are the eigenvalues of this matrix here? If you were to write the A minus lambda I and take the determinant, what do you think you will get? What you will get for this uh, determinant is uh, 5 minus lambda, 3 minus lambda, and minus 1 minus lambda, and zeros everywhere else. And that determinant is just the, the product of the diagonals, 5 minus lambda, 3 minus lambda, minus 1 minus lambda. And when you equate that to 0, that is a characteristic equation, the roots of which will give you the eigenvalue. So you can see the eigenvalues right here. 5 is an eigenvalue, lambda 1. 3 is uh, the second eigenvalue. And the third one is minus 1. So you can construct matrices so that you get the eigenvalues that you want. You just have to put them on the diagonal. When you have a diagonal matrix, eigenvalues are just sitting on the diagonal, right? And this matrix is real. This is in uh, R3 by 3. And it's symmetric because it's a diagonal matrix. I can actually go one step further and write another matrix based on the same matrix here. 0 here, 0 here, 0 here. But let's say 15 here here, 21 there, 35 here. What do you think the eigenvalues of this matrix would be? If you were to write the characteristic polynomial, which is this guy, it's 
it's going to be the same. So the moment you have a triangular matrix, it's very easy to compute the determinant and it's very easy to compute the, the eigenvalues too because eigenvalues are just sitting on the diagonal. So we were talking about spectral theorem. Let's take a look at uh, what this guy is telling us. A is equal to Q lambda Q transpose. So remember, this is for a real matrix and it's for a symmetric matrix. So what any matrix does to the vectors whose tips fall on the unit circle would be to take those vectors to vectors whose tips fall, fall on some ellipse. Then you know that, okay, there is an ellipse. You don't know anything more about the ellipse and that's it. But if I know that it is Q lambda Q transpose, that is a decomposition of A, I can actually do it one by one. So when I take A times X, I'm actually taking Q lambda Q transpose times X. So Q transpose will, up, will multiply X first. So that multiplication, Q is an orthonormal matrix. So Q transpose also is an orthonormal matrix, which is a rotation matrix. It rotates the, the coordinates through some angle. So I showed this rotation through a, an angle in the clockwise direction. Okay. And the second thing that applies to that product there is lambda, which is a scaling. Lambda is a diagonal matrix and whatever numbers you have will scale the corresponding uh, components of the vector. So it scales. So it might, it might expand one axis and it might uh, squash the other axis. And the second Q will rotate the, the ellipse again. So that rotation will take it to the orientation which is specified by the eigenvectors. So that's what it is doing. So that is the action of A decomposed into three matrices, easier to understand. So that is what Q lambda Q transpose is doing and that is its action that we can see. But let's look at the Q lambda Q transpose once more by expanding it out kind of algebraically. And if you expand it, you will have a Q transpose coming from uh, the Q transpose matrix because it's the columns of Q are Q1, Q2, Q3, Q etc. And Q transpose, the rows of uh, Q transpose will then be Q1, Q2, Q3 or transpose. So when you multiply, what you have in between is just a number. So that number can be commuted with the multiplication. Then you will get Q1 times Q1 transpose. That's what will come out of this for one term. And then you will have for the second lambda, you will have Q2 times Q2 transpose and so on. This in fact is actually telling you the orientation and the size of the ell ellipsoid if you think about it. But what it is actually telling you is something a bit deeper. If you remember Q1, Q1 transpose, that product that is a matrix, that is a rank one matrix because it's all built upon just Q1. And more than that, it is actually the projection matrix, a projection matrix that will take any vector to the vector Q1. It is a projection matrix onto the vector Q1. If I have a vector A, the projection matrix is A, A transpose by A transpose A, that is a projection matrix, it will project any vector, any vector B will be projected onto A. So PB equal to B hat and B hat will be some scale version of uh, A. So that is what projection is. Now if I know that uh, A is, is a unit vector, let's call it Q1, A is equal to Q1, then all I have to do is to put Q1 wherever I see A in the expression of P. So P is going to be Q1, Q1 transpose divided by Q1 transpose Q1. What's that number? That's going to be equal to 1 because uh, Q is normalized. It's a unit vector. So I don't have to have anything here that is just one. So the projection matrix that will take any vector to the subspace defined by Q1 or the projection onto the vector Q1 is just Q1, Q1 transpose because Q1 is a unit vector. So what it is saying is that uh, any real symmetric matrix can be written or decomposed into projections onto orthogonal subspaces. Orthogonal subspaces, each subspace is basically just a direction. It's just a subspace of one dimension. More than that, each such decomposition is actually a rank one matrix. So why is that important? So this could be the basis of some data compression algorithm. For instance, suppose you've managed to uh, to sort the eigenvectors in terms of its absolute value, such that the absolute value of lambda one is the highest, lambda two is the second highest, and so on. And if you're trying to compress A as a data compression algorithm like zip or whatever, then you know that if the numbers say lambdas beyond two, let's say lambda one and lambda two are fairly big and everything like lambda 3 up to lambda n are small in comparison to lambda 1 absolute value again. In that case you can ignore the rest and say that A is approximately equal to just these two. The rest are not important. They are like almost like noise. So if I have A let's say 100 by 100 matrix I would need 10,000 uh, memory locations to store it but 
if I were to write it this way, I would need one location to store that and 100 locations to store Q1 and one more location for that and 100 more for Q2. So it is 202 memory locations that I need instead of 10,000 memory locations. So that is a pretty good data compression algorithm. Probably not the best. There are probably better ones, but you have a data compression algorithm right there. More than that, you can kind of tweak the compressibility that you want by the amount of variability that you're capturing in terms of the lambda. So let's look at another the potential algorithm to compute eigenvalues. So the Sylvester's law of inertia also applies to real and symmetric matrices. The science of positive pivots, uh, the number of positive pivots would be the number of uh, positive eigenvalues. So that could be an algorithm. I would invite you to actually go and uh, implement this algorithm maybe in Sage Math because computation of pivots is uh, is fairly cheap because it's uh, Gaussian elimination. Those things are cheap compared to determinants and all that. Then once you have the pivot and the number of positive ones. What you do is shift the matrix by alpha and then you know that uh, the eigenvalues will get, get shifted by alpha. This we proved last week. Shifting means just adding alpha times i and then you look at the, the number of eigenvalues that flip sign. That would indicate the number of eigenvalues that are in the range 0 to alpha. So you can play with the range and narrow down the range 0 in onto the eigenvalue and that is possible. Not very easy. This is not a very good algorithm but it is possible to do it and you can also use the fact that the product of the pivots is a product of the eigenvalues. Product of the pivots would be the diagonal elements and that would be the product of the eigenvalues too. Diagonal elements are the eigenvalues. Once you have the, the REF, once you have done the Gaussian elimination, it's remember it's an upper triangular matrix and the determinant is just the product of the diagonal elements. Let's tread into the field of uh, complex numbers okay, and talk about Hermitian matrices. So if you have a matrix over the field of uh, complex numbers, C n by n this time, and if you have vectors that are also over the field of complex numbers then in general the eigenvalues are going to be complex numbers okay, so the vectors and matrices are all over the field of complex numbers even though we have vectors with complex numbers as elements we would like to have the size the norm the length of the vector to be real that is reasonable thing to ask right because it's a length and it cannot really have a complex number as a length so we would like it to be real i'm talking about euclidean norm this time but remember our definition of the norm is that the square of the norm is the is x transpose x for Euclidean norm and that will just turn out to be the sum of the squares of the elements and if you blindly use that for a complex vector then each element is a complex number and a plus ib squared is not a real number so the sum is not a real number which is not not ideal we would like it to be real so one potential solution for this uh, problem that you are encountering that we want real norms even though the vectors are actually complex is to use complex conjugate. Remember complex conjugate flipping the sign of the imaginary part. If you think of a complex conjugate times the number then it is a square minus ib the whole square which is a square plus b square and that is greater than zero and it is a real number to begin with. And this complex conjugation becomes an interesting thing to do with, with uh, complex vectors and we can define a transpose with of a vector or a matrix as taking the complex conjugate first for each element and then taking the transpose. And that transpose is called the Hermitian transpose. So what you do is you have a complex matrix or a vector, complex conjugate each element and then take the transpose. And then if you define the dot product as not the transpose times the vector but the Hermitian transpose times the vector and that then we can guarantee that this number is going to be greater than or equal to zero but is, is a real number. And now we come to the symmetry as defined for complex uh, matrices. It's not if the transpose is the same as itself but if it, if the complex conjugate transpose is the same as itself. So conjugate transpose and then it's called a Hermitian matrix. So what we are looking for is a Hermitian transpose is equal to a then it's a Hermitian matrix. So Hermitian matrix is like the generalization of a symmetric matrix but in the field of a complex number. This is actually used extensively in, uh, in quantum mechanics because the matrices that are Hermitian have interesting properties as uh, operators in quantum mechanics and also the vectors there are all complex vectors infinite dimensional but still complex vectors all right so let's look at eigen properties of hermitian matrices as opposed to real symmetric matrices so wherever we use real symmetric we can actually use hermitian because for a real matrix if it is hermitian it is going to be symmetric because complex conjugate of a real number is the 
same real number. That is in fact a test for the realness of a number. If a complex conjugate is the same as a, that means there is no imaginary part and then it is a real number. So the set of real symmetric matrices would be a subset of Hermitian matrices. And what we can say is the eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices are real, which in fact is a property that is uh, used in, uh, in uh, quantum mechanics, if I remember right. And the proof of this thing is in the textbook. Now, the complex vectors are not that important for uh, computer science as of now but by the time you reach your uh, the pinnacle of your career maybe complex numbers and complex fields might become important because people are working with uh, quantum computing and uh, their things are going to be over the field of complex numbers and there are probably data science algorithms that will come up that will be over the field of uh, complex numbers in fact i was uh, uh, a program chair of one of the conferences and there was a paper that was written with uh, complex numbers uh, being used because it was trying to use uh, quantum mechanics kind of ideas in data science. Even though as of now you may not find any direct application in computer science, it might come up. Eigenvectors of Hermitian matrices are orthogonal, just like real symmetric matrices too. Orthogonal means can be chosen to be orthogonal. The proof of this one also is in the textbook. Now, another reason for me to tell you this thing is that uh, since Hermitian is like the superset of symmetric or real symmetric, some people, I think just because they like the name Hermitian, might use Hermitian whenever they mean symmetric. So if you go to math stack overflow and look up some problem you might see the word permission being used just understand that it is actually just symmetric in the case of real matrices there's another one that is called unitary which is orthonormal for the case of uh, uh, complex numbers too so